Hello guys and welcome back to the Thinker Nick podcast. Today I am joined with a familiar guest as he was in fact the first guest we ever had on this podcast and now he is back to join us to talk about investing. Dan endeavors on business models, he evaluates the results and then he educates what does and what does not work. So Dan, welcome back to the show. Awesome Daniel, thank you for having me. An awesome job keeping the podcast going. I know it's it's tough always, get, you know, putting out great content and it's a tough game. So very happy to see you still going. Very excited to share more on investing as well today in all different areas. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks for the kind words, Dan. It's been a long road, but we're looking forward to the future. So basically in this podcast, what we're going to do is we're going to dive into investing, but we're going to split it up into three sections. The first section is keeping more of your money. And this is where we're going to look at reducing currency exposure. The second section is finding the Bitcoin bottom. And this is where we're going to be using the seed BBI confidence score. And in the third section, we're going to be finding companies on sale. And basically this involves buying stocks at half their intrinsic value. So Dan, talk to me. Why should we keep more of our money? <laughs> Well, it's actually, th this is something I wanted to start it with because a lot of people want to know about investing and, and things get like really complex very quickly and it scares a lot of people off. But also is obviously when you invest, the more you have to invest, the better. So it really is starting with how do I keep the most of my value? How do I stop losing that value through things like currency exposure, especially even recently, especially in the UK, we've seen such fluctuations in the currency. Um, and yes, that's an opportunity for like Forex traders, but it's also a risk to you where you can lose a lot of your value if you're not structured correctly. And that's whether you're running a business and you know receiving funds from customers in other currencies or paying suppliers in other currencies or even just transferring funds to family in different currencies. And it's something I've seen online where people will talk about, they'll say like certain company, certain companies and intermediaries have really good fees. And I'll be shocked because I know how terrible their like exchange rate is or their fees are. So I just want to start sharing a bit on that. Some, some of the, the really cool tools I have found, which have literally saved me thousands and thousands. So that's where I want to start. And then we can get straight into the investing part. But I think protecting your value, your wealth is also a key like starting point. Are you referring to apps such as PayPal and, you know, platforms that charge you that rate for converting currencies? Exactly. So banks, PayPal, and then all these other like much lesser known services. And yes, they're all these platforms where you would transfer money. So dollars to pounds, pounds to dollars, etc. And to show it, I actually have an example I'm going to pull up here. So as Daniel said, you, we're going to be going over keeping more of your money, finding the Bitcoin bottom and finding companies on sale. And now is a really good time for, for most of this. So keep more of your money. Now, let's say you transfer funds. This is you and your money in whatever currency then you're going to use an intermediary, Nick, like you said, banks, PayPal, et cetera. And you're going to pay suppliers, employees, family. But you might also do this the reverse. So you have customers, clients, employers, even other family members, friends. And again, you use intermediary and they pay you in your own currency. So it could be dollars, pounds, even rand featuring here. And then you might have your value and wealth stored in, let's say the UK in pounds. And the same, of course, if you transfer funds. But where the problem comes in is here, because let's say you're transferring money to suppliers, employees, family, those pounds need to be converted into dollars or euros, rands. And the intermediary is the key in all of this, because they determine the value of your pounds. 
So how many dollars are we going to give you for your pounds? And of course, are the fees for making that transaction for you? So that's what we're really looking at here. And I'm going to give you an example. Now, this is a real world example that I did this week where we're going to send a thousand pounds into dollars. So let's say we're paying another family member a, a thousand pounds, but they are in the US and receiving it in dollars. So first I'll show you the Google exchange rate. So that's kind of like our, that is the exchange rate. And then we're going to look at using something called world first. And this is one of those lesser known intermediaries. So it's, you know, not PayPal banks. It's a different one, which focuses on this issue of keeping more of your value when you make these transactions. So I'll show you this. And then I'm going to show you the difference when we transfer that same amount, but using PayPal or a bank. So this is the exchange rate. So it's on Google. This is the exchange rate. So $1.14 for every pound. So that means on Google per that rate for our thousand pounds, we're going to get $1,136. Okay. But just remember 1.14. That's how many dollars we get for pounds. So if we use world first with this intermediary, you can see that we're going to get 1.126. So almost $1.13 as opposed to the 1.14, which is the exchange rate. So we're getting about 1.13 and that's to be expected because world first is also a company. They need to make some money, but it's a very, very small amount that we're actually losing. So here we're going to receive a thousand one hundred and twenty seven dollars, not one thousand one hundred and thirty six. So in this case, it's a loss of nine dollars forty three and your exposure here is point eight three percent. Sorry, can you just explain exposure for the listeners and viewers? Sure. So this figure here, remember, we're losing nine point four three dollars. Uh, but if we look at that in pounds, what is that? About eight pounds. Okay. So we're losing eight pounds when we transfer a thousand pounds. So eight of a thousand. And again, I don't know the exact figure right now, but it's that amount of a thousand is your exposure. In this case, 0.83%. Got it. Okay. Awesome. And then if we look at PayPal, so here you're going to receive a thousand and eighty one dollars for your thousand pounds. So the exchange rate here is 1.081. Okay. Now, if we go back to this one, remember it's 1.14 on Google and we're going to get 1,136. So if we look at PayPal, 1.08. So it's not even 1.1 and here you're going to receive a lot less. Your loss here is actually 54. Point six dollars, and wow. your exposure is four point eight one percent. So a full four percent higher than if you use one of these other intermediaries. Wow, that's crazy! And has PayPal always charged these fees, even when it was like a startup company, like five years ago, or have they increased as the company's obviously built and been integrated into into different platforms? I'm not exactly sure over time, but I've always found them to have very high fees. Also with banks, you'll often find very high fees and it's because people value convenience over this. So it's not to say it's just a terrible company. They have a lot of value and convenience and they're very widespread. So a lot of people use them. So you have that factor. But if your goal was to keep the most of your value of your money, then this would not be the best platform for you to use. So they do have very high fees. The reason I wanted to share it is because I've heard so many people say their fees are so great and I'm, it's just crazy to me. So I wanted to actually get a real example and I actually put like the, the date and time you can see still at the bottom of those screenshots just to show you it's around the same exact time. So if we like extrapolate that out, let's say over time with your business or what have you, you convert a million via these different intermediaries. Well, if you use world first, you're going to lose $8,300. But if you use PayPal banks and you just don't focus on that conversion, you're going to lose $48,100. Wow. So 
Yeah, that's where it makes a huge difference is over time. Because if people look at like a, a hundred dollar transfer, it's like, oh, okay, well, I'm losing an extra eight dollars. But if they look at it over time, it's thousands and thousands. Okay. So with the business that we're currently setting up, we were going to uh, take payments or rather receive money through PayPal. So just looking at this has obviously, you know, deterred me from that. And I, I obviously don't want to use that system anymore, but it is very convenient for customers and, you know, and advertisers and things like that. So what would you recommend we use instead of PayPal? So that is a great question. So here is a list of some of the, the better known ones, although most people would not have even heard of these, but world first is a fantastic one. This is one I've used for multiple businesses and I absolutely love it. It's just, it's a very, very good service. So I'd highly recommend this. The thing to consider is they, it depends on where you're based and the currency support you need. Some of them support more currencies, others support less. There's also some countries where it's very difficult. For example, South Africa is a very difficult one. So you're very rarely will you find RANDs on these. I believe Payoneer actually supports RANDs, but very rarely. And when I spoke to them on that, they were explaining that certain governments want to keep all the, the currency within the country. They don't want it leaving or changing. So it just depends on the exchange controls of the country as well. But most major currencies are supported by all of these. And you can look into what's going to work best for you. The one I've used most is World First. I've also used Payoneer. And Payoneer also has a personal account, which means you actually get a personal debit card. So you could be, you know, Daniels, you could be in Thailand paying in that currency, you know, with the dollars that you've received. So, okay. And how is the conversion rate there? Will they charge you based on every transaction? That's a great question as well. So if you're looking for just like the best currency conversion rates, like keeping the most value, World First or OFX, definitely. Payoneer is good, but their focus is more on giving you the ability to receive and spend currencies anywhere. It's not going to give you as much control over currency conversion as with these here, because it doesn't have certain features. Like you can even set alerts on these top two for like when a currency pair hits a certain number. So these two here are the absolute best currency conversion. Payoneer is a very good flexible option, business and personal. And then TransferWise is another quite well-known one, but I haven't personally used them, but their rates also appear very good. When I checked this, the rate was just slightly above that of World First, but still astronomically better than like your mainstream payment systems. Okay. So have you ever heard of the banks Monzo and Revolut? Yeah. So with Monzo, you have to use TransferWise when you are doing international payments. With Revolut, I'm not familiar with, but what are your take on those two banks? Because I've actually opened a Monzo account since I've moved to the UK as I, I was told that it you know, was one of the most convenient, which you were talking about first, and one of the best. Well, the fact that they're using TransferWise is a really good sign to me because TransferWise is a, from what I've seen, remember I haven't used that one, but from what I've seen, the rates are very good. So the only concern I would really have is if the bank is using, is giving you an exchange rate and then using transfer wise, because then of course they, they can make a profit on the difference. But if it just allows you to directly use transfer wise at the transfer wise rate, that's very good. And it will probably be way more competitive than other banks not doing that. Okay. And when we go back to convenience and PayPal, so now I don't want to use PayPal anymore. What would you recommend for convenience for my customers, my clients, my advertisers? What would you recommend I use for them instead to make it convenient for them to pay me? Unfortunately, that this kind of happens sometimes where a company becomes so big that so many people are paying in it or receiving funds in it that you can't go without it until people you know, completely move over to different things or, or large majorities of them. So at this point, you would, my advice would be to still use PayPal. It still has 
a lot of value in terms of its reach and how many people use it. But when you're looking, when you have the option and you're transferring bigger amounts, then I would always, I, I would never choose that one personally, because why would I choose to lose more of my money? Absolutely. So it, it really comes down to that. You don't want to limit your customer base and actually earn less just to save on currency conversion. So that would be my advice there. Daniel, here's the other thing is if you're doing, you want to get paid by someone else, what you can do now, you can see on screen here, we've got a, a payer. So you've got your customers, clients, even your employer. And then it would go from, let's say dollars into through them into pounds in your bank account, let's say. But now what you can also do, remember, we've just looked at the exchange rate differences, but now what you can do is completely remove that. So the customer client employer pays you directly to your world first USD account. So now what's happening is you have a dollar receiving account, which means no currency conversion whatsoever has to happen at all. And you can do the same for pounds to pounds, euros to euros, any currency, because on world first, what they allow you to do is have all these receiving accounts. And they're not like some weird account. They're actually like you would have a USD account based in New York. It's like legit got all the routing numbers, et cetera, but it's in your world first profile. So anyone paying you thinks you have a legit US bank account because you do through world first. It will actually be with a US bank in New York, etc. So in this way, you completely eliminate that currency conversion. You have your dollar sitting there and then you can choose when to convert those to pounds or euros when the rate's good. Or you can keep them in dollars because you like to pay your suppliers in dollars and your currency never ever gets converted. Okay, but what if you wanted to move money within your different accounts within World First? So you can also do that. So you can rates? actually, what very good, okay. like, like I showed you, okay. very good. Fantastic. Wow, cool. Okay, epic dad. Thanks for that great insight. So let's now move over to finding the Bitcoin bottom line. And we actually just had two podcasts in a row talking about Bitcoin, blockchain and NFT. So make sure to go and check those out. Those are awesome. But you touched on you were going to be using the Seed BBI confidence score. Can you just explain to the viewers and listeners first what that is before we even get into, you know, the nitty gritty of the Bitcoin bottom? Yeah, cool. So I'm very happy you've had those experts on because I'm not going to cover any of like the like technical side of it. I'm going to like show you something super simple. So like if you want like the simplest way to like just view the, you know, Bitcoin market, that's what I'm going to show through this amazing little tool called CBBI. Uh, and it's actually the Collins Bitcoin bull run index. And it's this guy on YouTube and he developed this thing which looks at like all these different ratios, you know, like how um, for like the S&P 500, you'd have like the Schiller PE and all these complex ratios, which tell you kind of, is it high or, or low? Well, Bitcoin has those same things and he compiles, like, I think it's like 20 of them and mixes them all up and it produces a trend. And when you match that up to the Bitcoin trend, you can actually see when market sentiment, when people's confidence is high, that we're at the top or when people's confidence is very low, like they don't believe we're at the top. And it's like very telling. So that's what I'm going to show now. Okay, so you're telling me that this whole tool or this whole system is built on everyone else's perception of what they think the rate is. Yeah, so, so let me bring it up here. So finding the Bitcoin bottom. Now, what you see right over here is the Bitcoin price over time. So 2012 to 22, so a decade. And obviously everyone wants to know when are we here, right at the bottom. And everyone also wants to know when we're up here so they can sell because they want to buy here and sell here, of course. And then we've got that 2017 huge run up that everyone knows about. So I will use this as an example and so on to where we are now. But then we overlay. So you can see, you see this black line, it becomes the colored line. So I'm going to change it now. 
C, same line. So if we overlay this blue one, this is the CBBI index. So this is the one that we're very concerned with. We want to know when this is very high, that means everyone's confident it's at the top. And when this blue one's very low, that means everyone's confident is not very confident we're at the top. They're quite confident we're at the bottom. Okay. And so what that line is based on is all of these. You can see here, all of these are fused into producing this blue line. And what are those, Dan? So these are all like trackers of Bitcoin. So for example, you've got the two-year moving average here. So some people will pull up the the moving average and, and say, okay, well, Bitcoin doesn't like to drop, you know, below this moving average. And it will often look as though that's the case. Like it doesn't like to drop below the moving average or what have you. But skipping all the like technical stuff, because I'm not an expert on all of that. What this does is it takes all of them. So some people might just use one or two but it takes all of these to produce a confidence value. So based on all these metrics, where's the confidence right now? Can you just, can you just um, read some of those metrics out so the listeners and viewers have an idea of what sort of metrics are being used? Mm. Yeah, sure. So this will cover things like the ripple chart here, RODL ratio, the two-year moving average, and all these others. And what it's going to do is produce this line. It's like an overall confidence score that we're at the top or at the bottom. And so if we look quite close, let's look at the 2017 one. You can see this was the major run up to about 20,000 that everyone will remember. But at that point, if you fuse all those metrics together, you can see the CBBI confidence is 100 actually at that point. And then of course, it dropped all the way down to about 3,200 and the CBBI confidence was two, two out of a hundred. Mm. So you can see how that independently of Bitcoin itself, just looking at those ratios, as seems to be quite accurate. And then we had our biggest, we had kind of a weird run up this last time. It didn't feel like that peak. Like if you look at these, see that like sharp spike, it felt like that didn't happen. And if you look at it, it kind of looks that way. Like it looks like this one should have gone way higher. Why is that? Why is why did that one not go as high? No idea. But the thing is, it kind of is telling because the CBBI confidence was only at 84. It wasn't at that like 100 level. And also if you go back to like this spike, it was at 100. So this 84 is indicative that it didn't have that feeling. It didn't go to the top and everyone else, that confidence wasn't there because independently of this, I felt that way. I didn't feel that hundred were at the top. You know, I didn't feel even 90. So that's kind of telling there. And then of course, now we're way down. And remember over here, when it came back so far, it was a two. Well, the lowest we've seen in the past kind of two months is a six but we're very, very low. Of course, with any ratio or metric, you don't want to use the absolute. Like who's going to wait for one? It's like very difficult or a yeah. hundred. Very. What you're looking for is like, okay, when it's in the lower 15, that's probably a decent time to buy. Or when it's in the top 15, probably a, a good time to start thinking about selling or even the top 20. Because remember like this one here went to 84. So if you started selling a bit in that top 20, you caught a bit of that peak. So that's just how I look at it. Of course, none of this is investing advice. Like you have to make your own call. I'm just explaining how it could be used and how I like to use it. Okay. So, and is, is, this just, is this just Bitcoin or is this all cryptocurrencies? No, is this, this just is, just, is just Bitcoin. Yeah. Okay. Another reason I'm happy you had the other guests because I'm not an expert on all the alts, etc. And so on the Bitcoin price, the lowest we've seen currently on the confidence score is a six in the past kind of two months. And then here two days ago, like right now, we're at like a seven, but still very, very, very low. So because a lot of what I like with this, 
is if you only look at the Bitcoin price, like if you only look at this one, let's see if I can jump back to it quick. If you only look at this, it always feels like, wow, it could go, you know, it could just keep going down. It could just like go. And, and of course it could, it's a possibility. But what I really like about this is that this confidence score seems to, to track in some way. Like you can see full confidence top, lowest confidence is bottom and so on. So that's what it's a, an additional asset I like to use in making decisions around this. So what you're telling our listeners and our viewers to do is to get in on Bitcoin now. <laughs> no, definitely <laughs> not. Like I, I won't give investing advice. I'm just sharing really a cool tool I like to use for my investments, you know, because it is a risky asset. Like I wouldn't tell someone to put everything, sell the farm, put everything in Bitcoin just because this confidence scores low and has kind of evidenced itself in the past two big dips. But if someone had, or let's say for me, let's say I had some spare cash, I would probably be looking right now at number one, Bitcoin, and number two, buying very good companies on sale because everything is way down. Like people are talking recession, like this is a, a time when a lot of people shy away from things, but historically, this is the time. This is the time when huge, huge fortunes are made because people buy, you know, as Warren Buffett said, I think he said, I'm paraphrasing, but buy when there's blood in the streets. So when everyone's fearful, that's when you want to get greedy. The bigger challenge is how much cash do people have? Do you have the available cash to take advantage of the opportunity? So that's what I would say. Definitely don't be taking loans and things like that and selling the farm. But additional cash, I think it's, it's a, for me, it's a reasonable time to be looking across all these assets. Awesome. So then let's just dive straight into section three and find those companies on sale. You mentioned that you were gonna talk about buying stocks at half their intrinsic value. So for the listeners and viewers who have no idea what intrinsic value means, or pretty much don't even know how to buy a stock, can you just touch on what both of those things are? Yeah, sure. So this is actually value investing. And the core principle of this, and if you get this, you get it. So the core principle is that the price of a stock is not its value. A good example of this is let's say Tesla stock, okay? Elon Musk tweets out something really popular. Nothing has changed with their factories or cars or how many they're selling or anything. Nothing's changed, but the stock price will go up. And that is because the stock price is not indicative of the underlying value. It's indicative of market sentiment. It's how much people think a company's worth or will go up over time. It's not based on the actual intrinsic value of the company. So for a value investor, the key is finding when is finding that intrinsic value. And that's not something I'm going to go through fully here for time. But uh, Daniel said that he would link it below. So let's say you want to find out the intrinsic value of Tesla. What you're going to do is things like um, discounting future cash flows and other methodologies. But that video will show you how to find the intrinsic value of Tesla. So what's it actually worth? And the goal for a value investor is to buy Tesla when the price on the stock market is below that value. You know the company's worth this within a margin of safety. So when the price is down here is when you buy because you know there's a good likelihood it's going to go up. So that's exactly what value investing is and how intrinsic value, like what the company is actually worth, is very different to the stock price. That's, that's essentially how value investors make money. And right now, everything is down. So everything, let's say the value is here, everything is like down here. So this is when value investors are, are, are buying. Okay. And guys, just to double mention that if you are really interested in value investing, you must check out Dan's video, which, which we will link down below. So let's just elaborate on, on the, the third section, and that's finding the companies on sale. Awesome. 
yeah, perfect. So find companies on sale. And this is the key part I want to start with actually. And I stole this from rule one investing, highly recommend. Uh, this is a company founded by Phil Town, and he also has a YouTube channel, but extremely good stuff on value investing. That's specifically what they do. And let's say you want to start value investing. So you know the market's down, you have spare cash, and you've made the decision to invest. Well, the place you actually start is with companies. So you're going to get together a list of, let's say, 10 companies that you love, that you believe in long term. And you want to look at the meaning, modes, margin of safety, and management of those. So meaning is that you understand the business. You use its product or service, and you agree with its values. Most importantly, you wouldn't mind owning that stock for 10 years. If you won't own it for 10 years, don't own it for 10 seconds. The next is moat. So moats like around a castle it protects the company because it has a layer of protection somehow which could be one of these five it could be brand so the one that jumps to mind for me is amazon the brand's just so strong because customers know i can return it if i don't like it i know it's going to be shipped on time etc that's something exceptionally difficult to compete with for other even big e-commerce companies it could be secrets, which is that they have a certain technology or even intellectual property or even IP of a process which illegally other competitors cannot replicate or use. So competitors can't attack them on that front. It could be switching. So this is things like it's just too difficult to switch. Let's say you've been on Apple for years. It's very difficult for you to switch to Windows because you've been on Apple for so many years. You've got to learn so much to make that change. Toll bridge would be where they have some way of serving a certain market segment, a certain set of like customers, which other competitors cannot serve. Um, and that could be like for legal or geographic reasons or anything like that. They have quite a lot of control over a segment could also be things like requirements and certifications that they have that other competitors don't have. And then price, of course, is just lowest price. So people will go to like Best Buy because they know that's the only place I get the absolute lowest price. So any of those, and then the big five numbers, they're all above 10% for 10 years. So these are things like ROIC, EGR, EPS, sales growth rate, cash growth rate. And I'm not going to go through all of those, but you can find those for companies online and just ensure they're above 10%. And then management. So the CEO, they're owner oriented. The CEO is also driven and has like a vision for the company. And just overall, you trust that CEO. And lastly is margin of safety. And that's it. I'm only going to buy this business when the price hits my margin of safety. So for me, it's 50% of the intrinsic value. So remember we said we've got the price somewhere here. We've got the intrinsic value we can calculate. Well, that when I calculate that, I cut it in half for a margin of safety. Because when you're calculating intrinsic value, it's never 100% accurate. So you can then decide how much do you want to cut that down. Some people cut 25% off. I cut 50% off. So intrinsic value cut that in half, and then that is the stock price I'm looking to buy the company at when it's at or below that. So that's your margin of safety. And then there is just a screen of all of them in case you want to screenshot this. So Dan, you mentioned that you can go online and find all these figures. Is there any particular place that you can go to find all this information? Yeah, that's a good question. I like Yahoo Finance is very good for most of them. And then what I'll do Daniel, so send you the others that I do use and we can link those below for anyone watching or listening. That's probably the best way because sometimes you can find like the ROIC, like return on investment capital. You can find that on a, on say Yahoo Finance, but you can't find the EPS growth rate. So I'll send, I'll, I'll drop a couple links below to the sites where you can find those four companies. Fantastic. Thanks, Dan. 
Cool. So then what I'm going to do here is we're actually going to be looking at Amazon, LAM Research, AMD, and Invisalign. And to tell you a bit about these, so Amazon needs no introduction, really. LAM Research, they manufacture semiconductor processing equipment. And then AMD, also similar, but they also do like graphics technologies. So both semiconductors here. And then Invisalign, which actually do your Invisalign like retainers for orthodontics. So e-commerce semiconductors orthodontics so we're going to be looking over that sorry dan can you just pop back there for a second sure can you just explain to people what the ticker means 100 percent. so this is actually the this is what you will see when you're investing so you won't see like a logo or amazon you'll have a ticker and every single company has a ticker so amd it's easy because it's amd but invisalign that's a really like long word so on the stock market because they need to save as much space as they can on those like boards where it shows like company price, how much it's down. So everything has a ticker, which just is a, a way to indicate which company it is on the stock market. So Invisalign, that's a long word. So they just use a line like A-L-G-N um, and the same for Amazon, etc. And then the first thing I want to start with here is generally the stock market goes up over time. And this is usually, it's widely accepted by most people that over time, the stock market trends upwards. Yes, it comes down, goes up, has these huge drops. But if you look at it over the long term, it goes up over time. And this red line is actually the S&P 500. So it's like the biggest index in the US. And you can see over time it trends. Right now, yes, it's not following that trend, but that is where, that is, is, uh, where the money's made so okay so dan just before we carry on so like when you turn to the slide i just see lines and there's heaps of different information obviously so can you just explain where are these values coming from and what each line means yeah so this is just really an overview you can see the colors coded up here and this is on yahoo finance so google for example is uh, this purple one and you can see the line actually traversing behind here. I've just drawn that purple line over it. And then you've got like a line, Invisalign, pink. Again, this is the stock line, this jagged one. And then I've just drawn this pink line. Uh, sorry, why is your line diagonal and different to the spiky line? So all I've done is very roughly drawn over time, the, the stock market goes up. So if you look at like the S&P 500, this is going to be lower risk for, for is how it's seen. And you can see here, it has like peaks and valleys, right? So like here, I'm not drawing on it. Like, but what I'm drawing is generally, where's it going? Do you see here, like over long time, where's it going? Okay, I see. And then, so you obviously don't want to buy the blue one when it's like way up here. You want to buy it when it's like down here. You don't, you want to buy, you know, the lowest part of that kind of general trend. But this is not accurate. What I'm generally showing is that over time it goes up because a lot of people feel like when it's dropping, their emotions get hold of them and they go, it's going to drop forever. And that's not, if we look historically, what has happened. It goes down and it goes down a lot, but then it comes back historically. So that's all this slide is meant to start off with is it over time goes up. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in the long run with value investing, the investments always go up. I can't say always, but yes, in general. I mean, if you look at the line, the S&P has a, a huge track record, like decades and decades. And if you look at it just overall, it goes up. So that's my viewpoint on it is over time, the stock market always goes up. Okay, that's reassuring. And so here, what you can see is the tickers again, and this blue one. This is the S and P five hundred. The S and P five hundred is is kind of the kind of leading, you know, index. It is basically an index of five hundred of the biggest U.S. companies. Okay, all packed into this one index, and you can buy that index. And the thinking on it is, it's quite low risk because it has, you know, everything from you know, like FANG stocks, like your Facebook, Amazon, Google, and then all the way down to other uh, sectors, just across every single sector. So it's seen as lower risk, 
because if one sector goes down, the other ones support and so on. Whereas investing in specific companies like you see here, Amazon, Lamb, AMD, is seen as higher risk for most people because it's like, well, if Amazon makes one wrong move, like the stock's going to come down. It's like not as risk averse. It Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. So what this line is here is the all-time highs or roundabout. So over here, between September 21 and Jan 22, so that's one year ago, that's when everything had its all-time highs, basically, and everything on screen did. And for example, here, the yellow line, that's Amazon. They had their all-time high at 185 per share. Then you've got all the others. So S&P was at 4766. You've got Lamb Research at 729, et cetera. You can see they're all in that block one year ago. That was their all-time high. That's what you would pay in order to buy that stock. And so now what I want to do is we've got the all-time high. Where is it now? And what does that change from that all-time high about a year ago? So if we look at Lamb Research, it's a red line. It's now 330. And if we look at the difference there, that's a change of $399. So Lamb Research is down 55%. And I'm going to put the others here on their current prices. And again, the changes. Now, here's the interesting thing. It's like if you look at the S&P 500, that's this one. So it's down 22% from all-time high. And then you can see... The individual companies are down massively. I mean, look at a line. Invisalign is down 72%. So this is where a value investor looks at it and says, well, I'm not going to buy the S&P 500. I'm going to buy the one that's 72% down. Mm. So, you know, there's more risk, but it's like it's worth it to a value investor. Yeah. I so see. That's, that's the difference here. Does that help make sense of it? Yeah. So you, you're looking over a long period of time, basically. So that's why you would like to buy the one that's 72% because you know it's going to go back up potentially another 72%. Exactly. That's why at the very beginning, one of the first rules is I wouldn't buy it if I wouldn't own it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, for me, Invisalign, I had Invisalign and I know it's an amazing product. Like it's absolutely fantastic. So for me, I love that company. I would buy that company. I believe in their product. So you will have your own set of companies like that whatever they may be. But I go through those checks and then you start to see a difference here. And then this is like a weird one that I'll probably get uh, like technical investors wouldn't like this at all, but I like to find a general level. So if you look at Amazon here, this would be at like a 150 level for me. And what I'm doing is I'm looking over time. So you can see this is like over two years and I'm looking like, where did the market accept Amazon's price a lot? That is, remember, because people are buying and selling all the time. And that indicates what they're willing to pay for Amazon. What is it, it worth to the market? Not the value, but what's it worth to everyone? And what I look for is a couple of points of support. So I'm going to draw the line where it's being hit, where a lot of, where a lot of action is happening. Where is it supporting the price a lot? So these green areas would be support. And what that means is you can see the price comes down, it hits this line, goes under a bit, but then it comes back. Or here, it hits the line, goes under a bit, but it comes back. And then on these ones, much more telling. It hits it and goes straight up. It doesn't go below it. It hits it, hits it, goes straight up. It doesn't want to go below this line. Do you see that kind of trend? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, and remember, this is over two years. So we're talking like months here. Then also what can happen is you see points of resistance on that same line, which is happening kind of here. This is a really good one. It hits it, bang, doesn't want to go above it, and so on here. But then this whole chunk here, it's like, I don't know, it's probably like nine months, is all above this line. And so this is always quite conservative. I take a conservative approach. For example, I could have drawn the line somewhere here, hitting like these peaks, this uh, support and yeah. so on and that peak I could have drawn a line here but that's much closer to the like top level I rather want to be conservative like I rather want to be lower on this you I know see. like like I know 
people are willing to pay this for Amazon. So that's the kind of level I'm looking for. Does that make sense? Yeah, gotcha. Cool. So there you can see it for Amazon, but we've included all our other stocks here and I've color coded them. So yellow, yellow line, blue, blue line, etc. And if we add in the others, he has those same general levels based on the exact same principle. So now we have the all time high, what it is now and the change from the all time high, and then the general level, like where we think, you know, where it's tracked for a very long time, and where we think it's definitely going to return to, then we're going to calculate intrinsic value. Now, this is a thing that takes a bit of time. And you would have to input some numbers. And I have a video on exactly how to do this linked below. But per the calculations I've done, you can see Amazon 292. So what this is saying is like the value of Amazon as per the methodology I've used is 292. That's what the company is actually worth. Lamb Research, AMD, Align, all of the values here. And you can see the values are much higher than what the price is right now. Sometimes when you do this, for example, with AMD, I think this is quite high, this 305 value, and it's now 57. Take that with a pinch of salt. Remember, calculating the value is not going to be absolutely perfect. And that's exactly why we use a margin of safety. That's the next one here. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the fair value, what it's actually worth, and I'm cutting it in half. That's my margin of safety. So cut that in half, 146. Cut that one in half, that one in half, etc. Now this margin of safety, that is my, that's when I get very interested. When the price, okay, as, as like here now, when the price gets close to this, half the value, that's when I'm interested. And then what I've done is I've just put the price here again, because this was like four days ago. And then this is a bit more current from like, I think yesterday, but they're around here. So when the price is close to this or below this, that's when I'm looking. And so based on that, obviously Amazon, well, we are actually below the margin of safety, 146. Lamb, we're actually above. The price is still a bit above half of that value. That's really up to you as an investor. And then these would also be green because they're below. A line is literally almost exact. So I would definitely color that one green. Does that make sense, Daniels? Yeah. So basically for all the listeners and viewers, what you want to do is you want to value the company over, say, 10 years to see what it could be. And then you want to cut that price in half, which is your margin of safety. And then if the price now is less than your margin of safety or thereabouts, if you are a value investor, it is a good time to buy because you have calculated what you believe the company will be worth in 10 years time. Well, is you're that, actually, right? it's, it's almost spot on, bro. So you're actually calculating the value of the company today, but you're correct in that it's often using 10 years out. So it could be like taking future cash flows of a company. So it's saying, okay, what are the expected future cash flows? And you're basically working out the value of the company in 10 years, but you're then discounting it back to today. So it's too complex to explain like just in a, in a podcast, yeah. especially with our time. But that's what you're doing essentially. So yes, you're extrapolating like out to 10 years and then you're discounting back to today for the value of that stock today as per your calculation. And then knowing that value, you choose a margin of safety. For me, it's 50%. For you, it could be bigger, smaller, but that gives you a margin of safety on your calculation being right or wrong. And then that for me is the target at which I'm gonna start looking very closely at the stock. Okay, epic. Dan, thank you so much for all that great, valuable insight. So for all the listeners and viewers, if they want to find you, where can they find you? Awesome, Daniels. I hope it was helpful because I think now's the time, you know, to start looking. If you've been considering investing, whether it's in uh, crypto or stocks or pretty much almost anywhere else, now is, is a pretty good time if you are sitting on additional cash you want to put to use. But if anyone does want to follow me, you can do on YouTube. It's just a channel under my own name, Dan 
Rogers. Rogers has a D, by the way, <laughs> uh, but you can find me there. We'll drop a link to it below. I actually specialize in e-commerce, like Amazon FBA, but I also touch on investing and all these different things. And thank you for having me, Daniels, because it's uh, it's cool to cover all of these kind of niche topics as well, like things I'm doing kind of outside of e-commerce. And I really appreciate you wanting me to come on for this. Fantastic, Dan. Well, it's great to see you. It's great to catch up. And hopefully this won't be the last time that we'll have you on the Think Connect podcast. So all the best until next time. Cheers. Awesome. Thank you. For more news and content about Think Connect, go to www.thinkconnect.com or visit our Facebook or Instagram pages at Think Connect.